Hello and welcome to the symposium, Creating the World We Want to Live In. I would like to start by thanking the Congress organizers for this invitation. It is a true honor to have an invited symposium at this great Congress. My name is Dora Gudmundsdóttir, and with me today are my colleagues. We are a group of people from around the world who have met at several positive psychology conferences, and we share the passion of using the science of positive psychology to creating the world we want to live in. In this group with me are Bridget Grenell Cleave from the UK, Felicia Huppert from UK and Australia, Vanessa King from UK, David and Sue Rafi from the UK, and Martin de Vries from the Netherlands. Our aim is to inspire people to see why we urgently need a different approach to how we live our lives and to begin to make changes individually and with others. We started to explore what does the science of well-being, science of positive psychology, say us about a better world. How can we apply these results? And this is something that we've been working on for the last years. And the results is this book, Creating the World We Want to Live In, How Positive Psychology Can Build a Brighter Future. We have a website, creatingtheworldwewanttolivein.org, and we encourage you to look at the website. We're also on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. So please, if you have any questions, ideas that you would like to share with us, visit the website, ask questions, and join us on this journey in creating the world we want to live in. There are several quotes in our book that relate to, and I would like to start with this one by Jane Goodall. You can not get through a single day without having an impact on the world around you. What you do makes a difference and you have to decide what kind of a difference you want to make. This is a big question. How can we create the world we want to live in? And we decided that we needed to uh, have different themes. And in the beginning, we go through the lifespan. There's a chapter on childhood, education, work, aging, and then on relationships, health, community, leisure, media, society, politics, and environment. And in this symposium, we would like to share with you what we have learned on this journey and what we have found out and how we have translated the science of positive psychology so it is applicable for everyone who would like to join us in building on this science in order to create a better world. I will now give the screen over to my colleagues and the next Line will be Felicia Huppert and Vanessa King. The screen is yours. Today our world is experiencing an accelerating level of change. Unprecedented in modern times. We are confronted with new and emerging technologies the multiple impacts of globalization and demographic shifts. Then there is the challenge of discrimination and racism. And what about the uncertain consequences of a global pandemic and the uncomfortable reality of a changing climate? Changes that will impact our societies and will have a big influence on our own well-being. but most importantly, will determine the well-being of future generations. We have a choice. We can passively watch it all happen, or we can individually and collectively take action to create a world that's better for everyone. For the last two decades there has been growing evidence that human beings need to both feel good and function well. The science of well-being. 
Based on a growing body of research it is proven that together we can create a better future for humanity and the planet we share. A group of scientists immersed in positive psychology proposes that the science of well-being can provide a new paradigm to help shape a different future. Drawing on their different individual fields of expertise, they had ideas for how this emerging body of knowledge could provide the basis for innovation and change. Bring the science to life and engage hearts as well as minds, and provoke and maintain a global conversation. They gently challenge possibly long-held views, beliefs, and ideologies. And invite you to create the world we want to live in. I'm Felicia Huppert. Um, our group of seven came together about five years ago at the uh, European Positive Psychology Conference in, uh, in Angers in France. Um, I had uh, convened a symposium on uh, positive psychology in society, and we got to talking afterwards and were absolutely astonished that this, this is pretty much the only presentation that extended positive psychology beyond the individual or the individual within the organization. And uh, all of us uh, believed that positive psychology had so much more to offer. So we, we began meeting to think about how we could uh, broaden the scope. And the following year, uh, we were invited to do a conversation hour at the International uh, Positive Psychology Congress in Montreal. And we had no idea if you know, people would turn up, but were astonished when there was standing room only. So evidently there was a hunger in the positive psychology community uh, for, for this kind of work, extending positive psychology beyond the individual to try to make the world better. But what we'd like to do today is share with you a simple framework that we've developed to try to take this work forward. And it's illustrated here in the diagram. So it's a series of concentric circles with the individual in the center, moving out towards uh, the interpersonal and beyond that to the institutional organizational level, further out to society and communities, and finally to the global or planetary level. And the idea is that the influence goes in two directions. So it goes from individual well being outwards with a ripple effect towards the people around the individual and outwards towards the wider world. But the influence also goes back in. So if we have systems, uh, organizations, communities that are flourishing, that feeds back uh, towards individual flourishing. Thanks, Felicia. I'm Vanessa King. I'm to help us explore the potential um, impact of applying positive psychology at a systemic level, we've identified five key psychological principles um, derived from the research. Um, these are factors that the research are essential for psychological flourishing. In addition to having economic needs and physical needs, we also have psychological needs. And our thesis is that these can be applied to help us think differently about our systems in the different domains of life and society to help create the infrastructure and architecture for well-being. And whilst these principles are derived from research on individual well-being, they can, we believe they can help challenge existing thinking around the different, at a more systemic level and can be applied to fuel innovation and shape new solutions in systems like our education system, in our health system, in community policy and public policy, and even in politics. They can help us in challenging old ways of doing things and designing new um, solutions. So these principles uh, that we've chosen to focus on are in headline, feeling connected to others, um, a sense of autonomy, um, feeling competent, focusing on, what, on what's going well, and us having a sense of meaning. So let's take a deeper look uh, at these principles. And I'm going to illustrate these with some examples from the workplace. And my colleagues later um, will be um, sharing examples of, of how these principles can be applied in other domains of life and society. So the first three principles um, that we've identified 
are derived um, from DC and Ryan's self-determination theory, as well as lots of other research. So the first, feeling connected to others. Um, it's interesting that the word well-being begins with we. Human beings are social creatures, and whether we are introvert or extrovert, we all need to feel seen and connected to others. And we know that feeling excluded at an individual level activates the same brain regions as physical pain, and that loneliness is, is de uh, um, seriously detrimental to our physical health. So at a systemic level, how can we apply this principle to help ensure that we design community interventions and workplaces um, as environments that facilitate connection and where people feel cared for and trust and support each other. I mean, Jane Dutton's work on high quality connections in organisations illustrates how this can add up beyond individual well-being to better team and better organisational performance. And of course, it ripples out beyond um, people in the workplace to their families and communities as well. So our second principle is to having a sense of autonomy. Having a sense of control is a core human psychological need. We need to feel that we have some choice, input and volition, regardless of our culture and at all stages of the lifespan. This doesn't mean complete autonomy, as that's hard in social groups. In workplaces, we can apply this principle to create cultures that are, are truly autonomously supportive, that give workers some degree of choice and freedom maybe not over what they do, but how they do they work, their work. And as we move to hybrid work, this need has significant implications for policies on how organisations track and monitor their employees as they're working remotely, especially when that's in their own home. The third principle is feeling competent. Human beings need to feel that they can function effectively and feel a sense of progress. Persistent feelings of incompetence are really detrimental to psychological well-being. So applying this principle means we need to make sure that our systems, our products, our processes are inclusive and easy to navigate for all. In workplaces, it can mean a focus on removing barriers to progress on a macro level, but also on a micro daily level for, for employees, customers and suppliers alike. And in a world that's rapidly changing, organisations will need to, to navigate what rapid change and uncertainty means um, for meeting this need on, a collective and in, on collective and individual levels. And the fourth principle, paying attention to what's going well, of course, um, the key researcher here is Barbara Fredrickson and, and um, all the research she and her team have done, um, means that we need, in addition to focusing on um, issues and problems that need resolving, wellbeing research shows there is extensive wellbeing and practical benefits from also noticing and building on what's right. In, the, in organizations and communities, practices such as appreciative inquiries show that seeking to identify and develop a system's strengths show how this idea can be used for extensive organisational and community change. Constructive journalism, for example, doesn't just highlight issues and apportion blame, but also explores constructive solutions and what has worked elsewhere. And finally, the principle of having a sense of meaning. Evidence from Michael Steger and others shows that a sense of meaning in life at an individual level is associated with higher life satisfaction, higher resilience and even healthier ageing. And meaning arises when people feel part of and contributing to something bigger, such as through relationships, fulfilling work, environment or social causes, faith, creativity or connection to nature. In the workplace, it increasingly means workers can see how their efforts make a meaningful contribution, not just to an organisation's economic sense, but to a purpose beyond profit, a shared purpose, such as climate change or for the community. This therefore has implications for an organisation's overall strategy. Our framework also includes three core capabilities. These are skills that underpin the principles that Vanessa has described. Although these skills reside in individuals, they have effects well beyond the individual, out into the organisations and systems 
in which we live and work. And these capabilities are an open mind, an open heart, and clear thinking. An open mind means that we see things clearly. And in order to do so, we need to really notice what's going on around us as well as inside us. This requires us to pay attention to our experience as we are experiencing it and to do so without instantly reacting or passing judgment. And this is mindful awareness. Research shows that following a typical mindfulness training course, participants have much better relationships, are much more likely to come to the help of a stranger and also to give a donation to a good cause. There's also growing interest in the effects of mindfulness on environmental behavior, where people become much more aware of what actions they're taking and the extent to which they benefit or are detrimental to the environment. And of course, when enough people have this kind of awareness and change their behavior, we can create major societal change and we certainly need to do this uh, as rapidly as possible. There's growing interest in mindful leadership and the idea of mindful teams where people listen more carefully to each other and speak more mindfully. And this leads to better decision-making and greater inclusion of all points of view. And one of the most interesting applications uh, of mindfulness is to policymaking, because of course, policymaking involves very complex decision making. And the mindfulness initiative, which started in the UK Parliament, um, has been working now with 45 uh, governments around the world uh, to help train politicians and policymakers in how to make these complex decisions. And one of the important elements is recognizing their own motivations, beliefs and biases, and the motivations, beliefs and biases of others, so that they can work more collaboratively together and come to policy decisions that are based more on being informed rather than on ideology. The second of the core capabilities is an open heart. Kindness and compassion open our hearts to the struggles and suffering of others. But we also have evidence that our well being is influenced more by what we do for others than what we do for ourselves. So there's an indirect benefit here of compassion towards others. And in fact, um, the evidence from brain science uh, shows that the reward centers of our brain are activated when we are kind and compassionate towards others. So it's a win-win. In terms of compassion training, sadly, it is something that is often needed because although kindness and compassion appear to be hardwired in the sense that we can see them very early on in small children, and in many social animals, these capabilities are often lost through circumstances and difficult upbringing and, and so forth, but they can be relearned and they can be improved. And this is happening now more and more in all kinds of uh, organizations, um, within families, within schools. And one of my favorite examples is the uh, kindness curriculum that Richard Davidson and colleagues at the University of Michigan have developed for pre-primary uh, children, which leads not only to them being kinder to each other, but also there are improvements in their cognitive functioning, uh, which is a very great benefit. And more and more, we're looking at compassion at work. The work of Jane Dutton and others uh, is increasingly important. Um, because being compassionate allows people to flourish. And when people flourish, they work better uh, together and they're more innovative. Um, and another uh, fascinating application um, is in politics. There's a new initiative uh, known as Compassion in Politics, where one of the aims is to ensure that every policy decision takes account of the most vulnerable in our society, 
and is good for them as well as good for others. And of course, when we extend compassion beyond humans to all living beings, it can make a huge difference as to how we want our planet to look. We're much more likely to save habitats, to care about biodiversity and ensure that our beautiful and extraordinary planet remains so for future generations. The third capability is clear thinking. And that's extremely important and more than ever in our world where we're bombarded with information, including so much disinformation and fake news. And we need to be able to evaluate it uh, so that we don't feel we're being duped. We need to recognize trusted sources and also be open to different ideas, to challenge our ideas. And colleagues uh, at the um, University um, of Cambridge Psychology Department have created a fake news game for um, teenagers, uh, which, which teaches them the rules of how you create fake news. And once they've played this game, they are much, much better at spotting fake news and disinformation in real life. So finally, I just wanna suggest that putting these three things together, an open mind, an open heart and clear thinking lead to wise action both individually and collectively out into the wider world. And I'd just like to hand back to Vanessa to say a little more about this idea of wise action. We need wise action because the choices we face are complex. We need to apply these positive psychology principles, not just for us individually, but collectively. And also not just in the short term, but thinking about their implications longer term for us and for future generations. So for example, in the workplace, the recent shift to hybrid working as we think about the future of work, what are the implications does that have for the communities that um, workers have left and for the communities that they are now living and working in? And what does it mean for the environment? Well, um... Moving from we to from me to we uh, implies, for example, that we don't just take the easy option of uh, accepting single use plastic bags or or buying cheap fashion. Uh, it may serve us very well in you know in, in the present, but it does not take account of the effect on others, and certainly doesn't take account of the long term effect on our resources. Um, so in the case of the environment, it's profoundly important to make that shift from what's good for, for me now to what's good for all of us now and in the longer term and also uh, of future generations. And I love that in Wales, they have a minister for future generations and every policy has to consider what effect it will have on future generations. Hello, I'm Bridget Grenville-Cleave and I'm a lecturer on the International Masters in Applied Positive Psychology at Anglia Ruskin University in Cambridge, as well as a positive psychology trainer and coach. I'm going to talk for a few minutes now about the development of positive psychology over the past couple of decades and how our new book fits in. As a movement, positive psychology came about in the late 90s because of growing dissatisfaction with the way that traditional psychology seemed to be preoccupied with dysfunction. It gave us permission to explore and research the brighter side of human nature and what the good life actually means. Early on, positive psychology looked at how we can help people to be happier. And it came to be referred to as the first wave. The emphasis was on individual well-being and the various practices and interventions to increase well-being. Not surprisingly, the smiley emoticon is often used to symbolise this focus on positivity. However, seeing the positive as good and the negative as bad led to a certain amount of criticism. Life really isn't that simple. Without doubt it can be very difficult for many of us. Critics argued that this focus on positivity placed an extra burden on those who were already suffering. Positive psychology's early focus on positivity gave the impression that sadness, anger or anxiety, for example, were things that needed to be fixed rather than a natural or appropriate reaction to the difficulties we experience in our lives. Even now, it's not easy to be open about our struggles with mental ill health. 
In the second decade of positive psychology, people like Paul Wong, Itai Ipsan, Tim Lomas and others have recognised this problem and have written extensively about what they call the second wave or positive psychology 2.0. The second wave makes clear that life has both ups and downs and that positive and negative are interconnected. You can't have one without the other. Second wave positive psychology recognises that there are downsides to the positive. For example, optimism can be taken to excess and lead to risky behaviours. And it also recognises that there are upsides to the negative. For example, being dissatisfied can be a catalyst for change or experiencing adversity can build our resilience. You could say that the second wave is more nuanced and gives us a more realistic view of well-being. This dynamic balancing act of positive and negative in the second wave is sometimes represented by the yin and yang symbol. So the science of positive psychology is now moving into its third decade. And whereas the first wave has been characterised by a focus on positivity and the second wave acknowledged polarity and the interplay of positive and negative, Tim Lomas, Leah Waters and colleagues have characterised the third wave of positive psychology as one which is broadening into complexity. Let's have a look at what they mean by that. Well, the first way in which positive psychology is broadening is in terms of its focus of inquiry. Third wave goes beyond the positivity of the first wave and even the dynamic tension between positive and negative of the second wave and explores the systems in which we live and work, which impact on our well-being, families, organisations, communities, societies, the planet itself. It's also becoming more interdisciplinary open to working with and learning from different fields, such as social and system sciences. Thirdly, positive psychology is moving away from its broadly weird roots, that is Western, educated, industrialised, rich and democratic, and is becoming more global and multicultural. And finally, in embracing other research methodologies, is moving away from the purely quantitative techniques to embrace qualitative and mixed method studies and using techniques based on data from social media, for example, online search patterns or electronic health records. And that brings us to our recently published book, Creating the World We Want to Live In, How Positive Psychology Can Build a Brighter Future. The primary aim of which is to change the focus from what's good for me now to what's good for us in the future, focusing on the relationships between people and the various systems in which we all live and work. In other words, on what we share. In the words of the neuroscientist Robert Sapolsky, what we need to thrive in the future is a better understanding of the contextual and personal conditions that bring out the best in us. We hope you'll agree that discussing, researching and developing the application of third wave positive psychology can help us both envision and design a better future for everyone. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Martin de Vries. Uh, in the symposium, we have challenged ourselves and in the book on which it is based, and now you, to explore what positive psychology can teach us for today's pressing global challenges and issues. I would like to now briefly outline what for me, as a professor of social psychiatry, trained in anthropology, and now a media developer, have become three linked domains, community, media, and health research and practice. From these data, we can say that, positive, that the positive psychology principles of finding meaning, feeling connected, compassion, and sharing experience results in increased self-efficacy, social cohesion, empowered action, and decreased mental health problems. Media and face-to-face -face communication, therefore, create more engaged and healthier communities. Given that, we feel that positive psychology, research and practice would do well to unpack the components of our social infrastructure for guiding further interventions for the public good. Communities, for example, are a central part of our social structure and have been so throughout history. Urbanization and technology are rapidly transforming them, but they remain the home ground for well-being and identity. It is where we experience support and belonging 
and comprehend the context of our lives as well as counteracting the scourge of loneliness. For most of us, as Sigmund Bauman has remarked, community feels good. They can be a resilient buffer when things go wrong, but may also be hostile to others outside the in-group. They are vulnerable to external and internal stresses, but their success as Putnam and many others have demonstrated is dependent on group participation, maintaining active social contacts, and positive leadership for facilitating and maintaining social cohesion. Over media, like this Zoom conference, media-based communication has become the mainstay of our social connectivity. During the pandemic, our resilience, particularly on social media, increased manifold and laid our need for social contact bare. While our media use has resulted in greater openness and connectivity, it also opened the door to negative use and manipulation. How we use media will to a large extent shape our future. We must assure it remains in accordance with our values and provides trustworthy information. Positive psychology can help in creating a more human media through actively advocating compassionate communication. For this, as data from media pioneers over 50 years have shown, it is important to interact with existing media platforms, newspapers and the like, develop relationships with media personnel, and contribute actively, sharing our stories, controlling our media involvement, as well as increasing our media skills, and developing intolerance to its misuse. Communication, community life, and our health are also intimately related. Work by Rose and Eupert show that common health disorders are directly related to well-being in the community. Marmot's research on social indicators, as well as my research on how constructive use of media can improve mental resilience in global community, communities demonstrates that health outcomes are related to social connectivity and communication. In short, a healthy society is created, created by collective participation of its members. But we must remember that health is not what doctors do or the health system does. Health is what people do. These elements and the others in the symposium are all part of the me to we strategy of this symposium and our book on which it is based. We urge you to apply positive psychology to today's social problems. Our challenge is to help forge proactive and socially connected individuals and societies that can contribute to a social infrastructure of healthy communities. We can do this in part through a positive and compassionate use of media. We invite you to join us, and the key to success of these approaches lies in our participation. Thank you. Hi, I'm David Roffey. Policymakers have been criticized by scientists around the world for making huge changes in people's lives without ever running trials to check whether their proposals actually work or achieve their stated aims. Banerjee and Duflo's work on evidence-based policymaking was rightly recognised with the Nobel Prize. However, the last 18 months have seen governments inadvertently running a huge, non-random, uncontrolled trial on the benefits of policies that prioritise a nation's health and well-being. Governments believe that they face stark choices between saving lives and economic growth. Some chose to prioritise the economy by delaying and minimising actions to deal with the pandemic, while others went in hard and early to prioritise health and well-being. Experience has shown this to be a false dichotomy. This graph, compiled by Our World in Data, shows what happened at the peak of the pandemic's first wave in the second quarter of 2020. Now, there's a lot going on here with many differences in the detail and timing of policy reactions, but one thing is clear. Countries that chose well-being over the economy did no worse, and in many cases had significantly better economic outcomes than those that prioritised the economy. 
as well as generally having far fewer hospitalizations and deaths. Backing this up, the next few graphs come from a recent Lancet publication analyzing the differences between those OECD countries who went for an elimination strategy, Australia, Iceland, New Zealand, Japan and South Korea, versus the rest of the OECD. As you already know, death rates were much lower. You may not know that there were an average 125th of the death rates elsewhere. We've already noted that GDP results were better. Here we can see that the fall was less and the recovery faster and stronger. The new result here, obvious from lived experience, but interesting to see illustrated, is that the countries who locked down hard and fast actually had less severe lockdown measures overall than those that waited. Politics and economics have an enormous influence over all aspects of our lives from cradle to the grave. So of course, they're also important to our well-being. Many of the big issues we face today are complex and global and unlikely to be solved by one political party or even one country acting alone. We stand a much better chance if we work together. And one good thing that a crisis like COVID-19 has shown us is that cooperation is possible. It has also shown that when it comes to an acute crisis, billions of dollars can be found to fund solutions. Now we need that to be generalized to the funding of the chronic long-term crises in the climate, economic inequalities, and many other fields. Positive politics isn't just about how different policies or processes impact on our well-being, but how the science of well-being can impact politics and change it for the better. For example, increasing trust, listening, and the ability to collaborate for the greater common good. Positive economics is about building an economic system that brings out the best in people, not the worst, that recognizes the community costs and benefits of economic actions and supports those at every level who need help to change the way they do things. The evidence suggests that if economic and social policies were focused on increasing the nation's well-being, society could be more tolerant, cohesive and resilient. Making political and economic decisions based on what increases well-being should be at the heart of an effective, well-functioning society and a resilient, collaborative, thriving world. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dr Sue Roffey. Thanks to my colleagues and fellow authors for giving you all a taste of the evidence base underpinning all of our writing in creating the world we want to live in. I'm going to take a slightly different tack to summarise some of the practical implications of this research and especially how it applies to the way we nurture and teach those who will eventually take over from us. All my professional life, I have been involved with children and young people and have come to understand that how we parent and educate our children has immense implications, not only for their own well-being, but for the future they create. We all want children to be happy and healthy, of course we do, but we need to go much, much further than that in raising the next generation. In the beginning of the childhood chapter, I quote a 2014 Harvard study of over 10,000 young people in 33 schools in the US that asked what was important in their lives. Self-interest was paramount with caring and fairness low in comparison to being happy and getting high marks. The messages those young people appeared to be getting is that what matters most is me. And the happiness they were told to aim for was based in stuff and status rather than in meaning and connection. No wonder we have an escalating mental health crisis. If we want to create a world where more of us can flourish, young people need to learn what is important, not just for their own well-being but for our planet and the people in it. It is these young people growing up now who will become our politicians, company directors, educators, parents and consumers of the future. 
all adults can make a difference to how children think about themselves, other people and the world they're in. Research, for instance, says that the parenting approach that has the best outcomes is warm and accepting, but also has high expectations of how children behave towards others. Schools need to include learning to be and learning to live together, as well as academic subjects. This is often referred to as social and emotional learning and has proved to change attitudes, the ability to manage feelings, especially difficult ones, increase a sense of belonging and raise achievement. We also need both critical thinking and citizenship on the agenda so our young people understand that accepting diversity strengthens all of us and that fairness matters. They need to be able to evaluate what they are told and check that against the values and evidence that to promote a better world for us all and perhaps bear this in mind when they vote. The wealth of research in the spirit level by Kate Pickett and Richard Wilkinson shows that the more equal a society, the higher well-being there is for everyone. Young people are taking a lead in this new reset for our world, but while some peddle hate and division, we cannot stand by and be silent. It is up to all of us, parents, educators, policy makers and positive psychologists to make sure that every decision we make has the long-term future in mind. Imagine, for example, a society where kindness is the default mode of interaction and people are not hungry, homeless, abused or rejected because of their race, religion, gender, disability, sexual orientation or social position. A future in which everyone is valued equally. What difference would it make if promoting the common good was a central principle in policy making and not just an empty electioneering promise? This utopian vision is almost laughable, except that there are efforts at making it happen. And overall, things are moving in a more positive direction. Felicia and I identified some of these in the chapter on society and many, many more are on the website. But it takes all of us, not just a few. As Nelson Mandela says, it is in your hands to create a better world for all who live in it. Thanks for listening.